on college campuses and actually inciting harm towards Jewish students. It was shocking to see that hundreds of students that I knew in my classes were spreading misinformation that BDS failed because the Jewish community had way more money than the people who support BDS who have to work and can't afford to go vote. There is a very thin line between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism today. When you import the conflict by turning against the Jews and make every Jew responsible for events in the Middle East, which becomes a form of anti-Semitism. All the red lines have been crossed. And as anti-Semitism is not condemned when it is expressed, you have all these anti-Semitism that are today a free-to-go pass. You have BDS on campus. You also have demonstrations where they call on killing the Jews. You also have demonstrations going far beyond insults or threats. It's really something that tries to work on the subconscious and make the Jew the guilty person. That's really the fear if you're scared of being Jewish in public, scared of living a Jewish life. I mean, not only are you letting the people who hate us win, we're really abandoning our culture that we followed for thousands of years. Even if we cannot totally stop it, I want to be this voice that will say, no, this cannot happen. I want to do it, not for me, but for my children, as a grandmother, for my grandchildren, my granddaughters. I think it's important to fight this fight. And I'm gonna walk this walk until um, I cannot do it anymore and hope that there will be other people that will come forward and continue this uh, fight. As you heard my grandfather say, he lived it, he survived it, and he witnessed the dangers of anti-Semitism. Educate yourself, speak out, and use your voice. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. These are the words spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in 1957. He was speaking at a time of heightened assaults against the black community and its institutions. The symbol of darkness for humankind's inhumane treatment of one another appears in Jewish tradition as well. In the Exodus story, we're told that the plague of darkness that befell Egypt <laughs> to free the Israelite slaves was so thick that the Egyptians could not see one another. Our sages liken that real darkness to the symbolic darkness that prevented Egyptian taskmasters from seeing the suffering of their fellow human beings. Today, it often feels like we're submerged in that same darkness. When people are harassed and harmed in our streets, gunned down in places like Charleston, South Carolina, Pittsburgh, Poway, Christchurch, New Zealand, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, El Paso, Buffalo, and Laguna Woods. When houses of worship are vandalized, when extremists are emboldened and hateful rhetoric is part of the public discourse, when all of this happens, darkness prevails over light. Dr. King's words beseech us to search for light within ourselves and to spread that light so that each of us can be an agent for driving out darkness. And so today we're here, a community of leaders and stakeholders, to spread that light and to be those agents. We know too well the stories of darkness and countless others, the stories that are the humanity behind the data of, on the alarming spike of hate crimes and hate incidents in recent years, acts of hate targeting Jews and other communities locally, nationally, and globally. Meanwhile, our democratic institutions are being threatened in ways we have not seen since the American Civil War. And none of this is coincidental. It's a pattern we've seen throughout history. In 1939, as Germany solidified restrictions on the civil and human rights of its Jewish citizens and began its assault on Europe, and in reaction to Father jo Charles Coughlin's anti-Semitic rhetoric that flowed from the radios into the homes of millions of, of Americans, three Harvard University faculty members warned of the dangers that begin with anti-Semitism. 
They saw how attacks on Jews were fueling attacks on others and on our democratic principles. In a pamphlet that the university circulated widely, they wrote, we oppose anti-Semitism not only because it's false and unfair, but because anti-Semitism and democracy cannot live side by side. The late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs echoed this warning in his 2016 address to the European Parliament when he said, the appearance of anti-Semitism in a culture is the first symptom of a disease, the early warning sign of a collective breakdown. The hate that begins with the Jews never ends with the Jews. No society that has sustained anti-Semitism has ever sustained liberty or human rights or religious freedom. For the sake of our society, it is incumbent upon us to understand these ideas and to heed these warnings. And so today we endeavor to do just that with the guidance of renowned experts who come to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience and who bring nuanced perspectives to critical conversations about anti-Semitism in its complex nature. Together we will unpack the ways that anti-Semitism threatens all of us and gain tools, resources, and wisdom to help us forge a way forward. As you engage with abundant new ideas and information, you'll be exposed to viewpoints that are both familiar to you and different from your own. You may be challenged by some of what you hear. The question is, what will you do when you're challenged? Our hope is that you will lean in, listen with empathy, and with the intention to understand so that together we can drive out darkness. Before we begin the learning, there's a few quick thanks I want to offer. Actually, a lot of thanks, but I'm going to do it quickly. Um, Thank you to our Summit Steering Committee, Rabbi Peter Levy, Rabbi Rick Steinberg, Dr. Matthias Lehman, and Ida Kelly, and to the presenting organizational partners, the ADL of Orange County, Long Beach, Congregation Shir Hamalot, and UC Irvine Center for Jewish Studies. Thank you to Jewish Federation and the Rose Project for allowing us the space to create this, and to my incredible team and our volunteers for making this day run smoothly. UC Irvine is a most fitting setting for today's summit, and I want to express my gratitude on behalf of Jewish Federation to the university for our long-standing partnership, one that's rooted in our collective efforts to raise awareness of and combat anti-Semitism in all forms of hate. Thank you to our host, UCI's Office of Inclusive Excellence, under the leadership of Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Dr. Douglas Haynes. And thank you, Thank you all for being here and to our many ally partners for your support. I wish you a most successful day of learning. And it is now my honor to invite to the stage Dr. Howard Gilman, the sixth chancellor of the University of California, Irvine. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for everything you do as well. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to UCI. We are delighted and honored uh, to support this extraordinary gathering in service of our community and indeed in service, I think, of the nation as a whole. Uh, some of you may know that the great motto of the University of California is fiat lux, let there be light. And we are gathered to bring the light that will drive out the darkness the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of intolerance. We may, be a, we may be talking about dark things today, but this room is a room of joy and optimism and determination to move our community more toward the light. Almost exactly five years ago, we witnessed a crowd of people marching through Charlottesville, chanting, Jews will not replace us. Some might have hoped that the Unite the Right rally would be an aberration highlighting the views of fringe extremists, if only. Instead, it was a harbinger. And the blood and soil radicals have, if anything, been emboldened and in no small measure welcomed into the mainstream of politics, both in the United States and abroad. In just this past primary election season, there were candidates for public office who openly proclaimed their hatred for Jews. The Republican nominee for Arizona governor recently endorsed an Oklahoma legislative candidate who has said, the Jews are evidence that evil exists. 
Kim Crockett, the Republican nominee for Secretary of State of Minnesota, described George Soros as a puppet master of her Jewish opponent. And the problems don't just come from the right. We have also seen attacks from the far left, not just in Jeremy Corbyn's British Labor Party, but among others who claim that Jews should be perceived as white and privileged and powerful and oppressive, rather than as persistent victims of one of the oldest, if not the oldest, hatred. It is no surprise that the Anti-Defamation League found that anti-Semitic incidents in the United States hit a record high in 2021, nearly triple the number of incidents compared just to 2015. Vandalism is on the rise, harassment is on the rise, assaults against Jews increased by 167%, Jews being beaten in broad daylight in the middle of Times Square, or Los Angeles, or the Las Vegas Strip. We at UCI are not insulated from these issues. We never have been. In fact, during UCI's planning stages in the 1960s, UC President Clark Kerr had to work hard to force an end to restrictive real estate covenants in this area. Many of you recall how 15 years ago in 2007, UC Irvine was in the news because of hate speech and hateful incidents that profoundly affected all of us, but especially our Jewish students, colleagues, friends, and neighbors. Since then, we, and by we, I mean faculty, staff, and students together, along with community partners, have worked very hard to speak explicitly about the scourge of anti-Semitism and to ensure that our Jewish students feel as if UCI is a place where they are welcome and where they can thrive. As one example, after the regents of the University of California denounced both anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic forms of anti-Zionism, we were the first UC campus to systematically assess how best to implement the regents' statement, and the resulting higher ground report provided over 19 separate recommendations to combating anti-Semitism, ensuring campus accountability, promoting education and training, and commitment to responsive engagement with our community. Among our activities were a series of events on anti-Semitism, including on the topic of anti-Semitic forms of anti-Zionism, featuring New York Times columnist Brett Stevens, and I know a good number of you attended this important community event. I'm not saying things are perfect, but as I said, we are not insulated from the larger world, but the work we are doing today means that we can all stand together and address these issues with a clear voice. Most recently, by the way, we have expanded our initiatives to support our work in Jewish studies. Through the efforts of our Center for Jewish Studies, we're working to establish a unique, new endowed chair dedicated to the study of anti-Semitism and a second chair in Israeli, Israel Studies. These are not just resources for the benefit of the university. At a great public research university, the expertise and capacity of faculty members serves our broader community. And this community deserves world-class experts on these issues, and we're committed with your partnership to making sure that both our academic community and broader community can benefit from that expertise. In addition, we're forging new partnerships with the School of Jewish Studies at Tel Aviv University and partnering with regional K-12 schools to provide training and curricular materials to teachers. You may have seen the exciting announcement that doctors Susan and Henry Samueli, good friends to many in this room, have generously supported our initiatives with a $4 million match for any additional giving toward UCI's Jewish Studies goals. We are incredibly grateful for their partnership and we're eager to enhance our partnerships with all of you and all people in our region of goodwill who cares deeply about these issues. In reporting on the unprecedented rise of anti-Semitism, the ADL's Jonathan Greenblatt has said that this isn't really a Jewish problem, it's an American problem. It is a Europe problem. 
And history has shown time and time again, as we have heard, that the scapegoating and targeting of Jews is just a canary in the coal mine for much broader threats and dangers, especially against efforts to create truly inclusive democracies. And so it is an act of great patriotism for us to gather, acknowledge the issue, engage in dialogue, educate ourselves, create new partnerships, develop strategies, and leverage our collective goodwill and our collective resources. This is a summit. And so let's reach new heights of insight and effective action. I thank all of you for being here. I thank all of our great partners at the Jewish Federation of Orange County and the Rose Project, at the ADL, at UCI's own Center for Jewish Studies, at Congregation Shir Hamalot, and every educational, civic, political, and religious institution and organization in our region uh, who is with us today. I thank all of our wonderful speakers and facilitators. Fiat Lux, Yehir Or, let there be light. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage Jewish Federation of Orange County's board chair, Heather Klein. Good morning. Let me just organize the height situation. Good morning. Um, my name is Heather Klein, and I am incredibly proud to serve as the board chair of the Jewish Federation of Orange County. I cannot express just how inspiring and encouraging it is to be here with all of you today on this campus and in this setting. For many of us, we are meeting for the very first time, yet we are united in our varied work to keep Orange County thriving and safe. We are all here because we share a deep concern over the climate for hate in our community and because we recognize that it is time for us to act. Time for us to act in the spaces where we live and work and collectively as an Orange County community to build a better future for the next generation. In case you are not familiar with the work of Jewish Federation, this summit is a perfect example of what we do best. Jewish Federation convenes and engages the Orange County Jewish community, providing strategic philanthropy, communal leadership, through grants and programs that enhance Jewish life and assist people in need. And this summit demonstrates Federation also mobilizes community, all of you, on collective issues of concern. At this moment of deepening polarization in our country, when it often feels like discourse on critical issues is becoming more and more fraught, Jewish Federation through its Rose Project, has found a way to bring us together for this important day-long conversation. We know that anti-Semitism is not the only type of hate that is on the rise in this country or in this county. Even as we explore the relationship between anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, we know that not all hate is inspired by anti-Semitism. And we know that our diverse communities carry with them their own unique stories and experiences of hate and intolerance, both historically and currently. My hope is that the Jewish Federation, in partnership with all of you, begins to write a new story rooted in hope for a better future. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Professionals of the Jewish Federation of Orange County, I welcome further conversation about these or any other partnership opportunities. And now it is my privilege to introduce our first two keynote speakers. You will find the full, illustrious, and robust bios of all of our speakers in our summit webpage, which you can access through the QR code in your printed program. As such, we will dispense with the long introductions and get on with it. Suffice it to say that our two opening speakers, Eric Ward and Oren Siegel, are national experts 
on the manifestations of anti-Semitism and hate and the threats that they pose to civil society. We are extremely fortunate to have both of them here with us today on stage where they will engage in conversation about the prevalence of anti-Semitism in the framework of discourse from all sides of the political spectrum, a critical first step in our efforts to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. Thank you. Um, uh, Eric, what, what, do you, what do you want to talk about? Uh, good to see you. It's very good to see you. <clears throat> I'll just say I'm struck by uh, discussions of anti-Semitism. I mean, you saw in the video and in the, the great uh, opening uh, statements that we heard, we're talking about really, really dark topics, hence the name of this conference. And yet I will tell you, in doing this work for, for 20 years, I've never been part of a discussion looking at some of the worst manifestations of anti-Semitism without the conversation actually being hopeful. Yeah. It's kind of like, all right, this is happening, what are we gonna do about it? And, and so this is why I'm so excited to talk to you, Eric, as somebody who's been doing some of the about it for, in different ways, in different communities for so long. Um, I feel like I have a bunch of questions for you. Fair. And uh, I hope that we can help set a, uh, essentially set the table for what so many of you are gonna hear throughout the day on these incredible panels. Um, so the first question I have for you, Eric, yeah. uh, why are we even doing this? Like, wh why is the issue of anti-Semitism leading almost every newscast, it's on the front of every paper, why are so many manifestations of anti-Semitism popping up today? Yeah. It's, it's great to see you, and I was listening to like expert introduction, I just want to be clear, right, Oren is the expert, I'm the pundit, right, uh, uh, up here, but it, it is true, right, that we are looking at a, a historic level of anti-Semitism in, in the modern age. And there is a reason, right? Uh, uh, and in some ways, it's, it's unavoidable, right? Anti-Semitism has always been tapped into, right, in order to build political movements, particularly in populist uh, moments. And we'll get a little chance to, to talk about this. Uh, but, the, but the world, how's everyone doing, by the way? Everyone's got coffee, right? It's great to see everyone. Um, I'm from Long Beach, right? So I grew up in, in Long Beach, just, just a little bit up the road, uh, uh, if there's anyone else from the LBC. And then I got to get a little love before I jump into anti-Semitism, because I saw one of my favorite concerts here uh, at UC Irvine when I was a young kid, General Public. And um, we're going to be talking about music. We're going to be talking about culture, right? We're going to be talking about politics and the influence that anti-Semitism is having on these things. But again, uh, very hopeful. So why are we facing this moment of anti-Semitism? I think we're facing it because the world is going through great stresses right now uh, uh, in the world and, and has been for a long time. The first one, or in being demographic anxiety, right? The, the shift of demographics, not only in the United States, but around the world because of migration, sometimes forced migration, because of economic pressures. And the demographic anxiety, right? The shifting demographics of a community, studies have shown, prove and create anxiety, right? Now, anxiety isn't a bad thing. All of us have anxiety. When I walked into this room today, and saw all of these amazing folks in the room, right? I immediately felt, right, a little bit of anxiety walking into a space of people that I don't know, right, in the rules. Well, this happens on a large macro level, right, each and every day. And we can talk about how that plays out in the United States, but it's playing out all over the world. That anxiety, right, usually we learn how to manage it, kind of like flying a plane. Right? Or I don't know if people have a fear of flying. But if you have a fear of flying, one of the things right, that a coach or therapist will tell you, right, that the answer to managing the fear of flying is to fly more, right? to fly as many times as you can. And the next thing they will tell you is that you'll never overcome your fear of flying. 
what you'll learn how to do is to manage the anxiety of, of flying. In the same way, we're going through this huge demographic change. We're having this anxiety that we need to manage as a country, as a world. Right? But we have folks telling us two things that aren't particularly helpful right now. On one side, right, we have groupings of political folks tapping in right, to this anxiety and telling us that it's an existential threat. Right? That, uh, uh, and we heard this on the streets of Charlottesville. Right? At first the chant was, you won't replace me. Then it became, Jews won't replace me. The media spent hours and hours dissecting, right? was it Jews won't replace us or you won't replace us? But the underlying article was, both were anti-Semitic statements. Right? Both were promoting the replacement theory, this idea that Jews right, are behind demographic change in the United States right, as a plot to destroy white America. The replacement theory is an anti-Semitic threat. We are seeing that narrative play out in American society, and people are tapping into it. So that's one source of anti-Semitism uh, in the United States and, and globally as well. Why should all of us be concerned about that? Because we are all victims of, of anti-Semitism. All of our communities have experienced the violence of anti-Semitism. We're most familiar, of course, with the tragic and horrific actions of the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, right? But we're less familiar with the anti-Semitic underpinnings of the murderer who walked into an El Paso Walmart and opened fire, killing Latinos. Or a young man, right, driven by anti-Semitism, who walked into a church in Charleston, South Carolina, killing black worshipers. Or an individual who walked into a Sikh house of worship in Wisconsin, right, killing people. In each of these cases, I'm not saying, right, that other forms of bigotry weren't at play, but the unique nature of anti-Semitism was the underpinning motivation in each of those cases. So I'm concerned because anti-Semitism isn't just a threat to the Jewish community. It's a threat to all of us, and it's being politicized to undercut uh, uh, democracy in America. That's just one form of anti-Semitism, though, right? There's anti-Semitism out of the left that may not be biologically based, but it breeds and taps into the generalized anti-Semitism that exists in American society. Neither the left or right, right brings anti-Semitism into our communities. They merely tap into the anti-Semitism that already exists. And so while we may not be able to do a lot about anti-Semitism on the left and right right now, except to point it out, there is lots that we can do in our own communities right, to inoculate ourselves from those who seek to manipulate anti-Semitism in America. So I, I want to underscore one, one specific point that you made about how anti-Semitism impacts other communities. And, and also, you know, uh, as, as somebody who uh, works with a team that is spending almost every waking hour in the online spaces where a lot of these hateful narratives are incubated, are spread, and animate real-world violence, that's what we do at the ADL Center on Extremism, it always strikes me um, the degree to which Every narrative can have like an anti-Semitic spin, yes. right? And so you mentioned the Pittsburgh shooting, um, something that I think not a lot of people understand. They know 11 people died or were killed at a synagogue by a white supremacist. They don't know that one of the primary issues that this individual was animated by was this great replacement theory, but the fear that immigrants were coming into this country, the browning of America, there would be no more white people, and ultimately the Jews were responsible. But here's somebody that in their online social media posts were focusing so much on anti-immigrant sentiment and at the end of the day, you know, ended up targeting the Jewish community. And in Buffalo, more recently, here's somebody that was clearly animated by anti-Semitic ideas and ended up targeting the African-American community in Buffalo at a grocery store because, you know, he felt that that was a more convenient, easier target. One other example, <clears throat> some of you may have heard of the hostage taking in Colleyville. This was in the beginning of this year. That's interesting, this is somebody who was an Al-Qaeda supporter, and essentially part of the anti-Semitism was I'm going to take hostage Jews in a synagogue, 
because Jews control this country and will able to free the person that I want freed. Right? So it was almost like a compliment. You guys are so powerful, which is obviously a, a, you know, also a conspiracy, um, but that's why they targeted the Jewish community. And so I don't know if we answer the question why, but it does underscore the need to combat other forms of hate. So when I, let me sort of get back to a, a question for you. Part of ADL's mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice for all. We recognize that the only way that you fight anti-Semitism is fighting other forms of hate, misogyny, Islamophobia, so on and so forth. And the only way to fight those hatreds is to fight anti-Semitism. Can you talk a little bit about now why, in particular, yeah. allyship is important and what can it actually look like? Yeah. So allyship coming together is, is very important. We realized this uh, uh, working with the Anti-Defamation League, right, way back in the uh, early 90s, late 80s in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, right? Much of what the country is experiencing was experienced in the Pacific Northwest and the Mountain West in the 80s. A rise of hate groups who were taking over local communities using fear and intimidation, right? Attacking civil society, law enforcement, attacking law enforcement, attacking elected officials, right? Uh, intimidating minority communities. And we realized early on, right? Uh, uh, and, and I often think it was interesting, Oren, you, you know this, right? These, these tables were, were super complicated, right? They, you could see a blue haired, that, and not me, purple uh, uh, punk rocker, right, with a mohawk sitting next to a Republican uh, rancher. Now, they didn't have everything, you know, they didn't have much in common, let's be clear. But we like all my, Like my Thanksgiving table, by right? the way. Right? It's like Thanksgiving dinner, right? And uh, many of the conversations were like sitting around the table, right, uh, at the holidays. Super complicated, right? Lots of conflict, but also lots of curiosity. Look, why it's important is, is it doesn't mean we agree on everything, but we understand bigotry and hatred, right, don't have a place in how we decide complex problems and solutions in our society. You know, quite simply, it's about adulting, right? And the, the thing we have to understand is anti-Semitism is like the opposite of adulting, and I don't mean to minimize anti-Semitism in this way, but if anti-Semitism didn't exist in the world, right, it would have to be invented right now because anti-Semitism provides simple answers, right, to complex issues by stereotyping and using tropes, right, against a community. So look, here's why it's important. It's important because we need to understand what is happening in our society. We need to understand when we hear anti-Semitic or other bigoted right, uh, uh, dog whistles in our society, when we're being manipulated by anxiety and fear. And that doesn't happen unless we're all in the room together. That's the important piece. The, the other piece I just want to say, right, as a non-Jew, right, as a racial justice activist, right, I, I am, when you all talk about liberal America, right, that's me, right? Um, when you talk about progressive America, that's me. When you talk about racial justice, right, I am that person. I don't hide, right, my own understandings of the world. But my understandings of the world are value add, not domination. And right now we have people in society, right, who have decided that their ideologies must dominate how everyone understands and sees the world, whether it's healthy or not. And anti-Semitism provides that tool, right? It says, right, that all of these things are happening because of a conspiracy, right? And if we just understand the, the conspiracy, that will be enough to solve the problems by blaming one group for everything. And so Jews are made to carry, right, the burden of every anxiety in American society. Blame for weather change. You know this. The ADL tracks these things on the daily case. Blame for immigration, right? Blamed. I can show you images, right, where, where the Jewish community is blamed for ISIS, right? It doesn't matter. Anti-Semitism creates an easy catch-all. And until we close that space, people will tend to use it to organize. Let's be clear, 
I'm an organizer, too. I should have said that from the very beginning, right? A good one, too, by the way. Um, but I will say this. As an organizer, right, when I'm based in a community, organizing a community, I don't organize a community around something that they don't already believe, right? Something that they already have energy around. And the fact that so many social movements are, in, are tapping into anti-Semitism, and you should talk about like the diversity of folks who are tapping into anti-Semitism. Uh, the fact that they are tapping into it means that they realize that there's traction. And so we have to come together, and the way that we're seeing this diversity of attacks on the Jewish community utilizing anti-Semitism, we need a diversity of responses, and that just doesn't happen if we don't get into the room together. And that's the hardest step. So, so I, I want to I dig a little deeper in that. I mean, how do you have a conversation with somebody who says, you know, I, I'm against anti-Semitism, um, and we see this on college campuses um, and elsewhere, but, you know, if, you, uh, if this person is pro-Israel, I really don't want them to be part of my, you know, social justice issue. That just merely the fact that whether somebody actually supports Israel or not actually is not often relevant. The fact that somebody is perceived to support Israel simply because they're Jewish, for some on the left, means that they are suspect, you know, because they have issues with, the, you know, policies of the Israeli government, etc. But we are seeing that increasingly play out where there's a certain baggage attached to individuals, Jewish individuals in the social justice space, because of the assumptions that are made about their politics vis-a-vis -vis Israel. So when you sit, and you are a good organizer, so I'm going to ask you this, like, when you sit with somebody who might say to you, I'm not sure, you know, we're going to lose credibility if we're working with somebody who's pro-Israel, how do you say, well, how do you address that? How do you make them look past an issue that they are often creating out of thin air? Yeah. Uh, the, the hardest part, so as, as an organizer and as a trainer, one of the things that we tell folks, right, uh, is you actually can't uh, counter racism without experiencing racism, right? It's one of the hardest uh, uh, things to, to hold. One can't challenge anti-Semitism without experiencing anti-Semitism. We've learned, I'm sure there are folks who are experts in, in brain science and in the mind out here, they can tell you, right, that uh, unconscious, right, so bias resides in the unconscious part of the brain primarily, right, and it comes out under stress, right? Why do people say bigoted and hateful things, right, when, when they're stressed? Because, because of the pandemic. The pandemic, <laughs> right? Uh, unconscious mind, right, is, is quite powerful. And so you, you have to enter a conversation, and, and look, there are limits, right? Um, but I don't think we've drawn good spaces right, around the conversation around anti-Semitism. And we have to have space where we can approach this conversation with curiosity. When someone says to me that they're opposed to anti-Semitism, right, my initial response, if they're a close colleague, is uh, how would you know? You have never spent time in a training on anti-Semitism. You've never read about the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, right? You've spent no time right, understanding the dynamics and the tropes and the stereotypes of anti-Semitism, how do you know that you're against anti-Semitism? So the first step in entering a conversation is to kind of explore with curiosity why a person believes what they believe, right? Giving a chance to unpack that and to try to probe with questions. But what you're really trying to get folks to, right? And I'm going to talk particularly on the left, right, where, where I sit in the racial justice movement, is we have to be better on anti-Semitism. There's, there's no excuse not to understand the fundamentals of, of anti-Semitism. It is having a huge impact, right, on our communities, right, and on the things that we find important in this moment. And so what I would say is you approach with curiosity, not conflict. You approach with questions, right? And you try to get people into dialogue, right, rather than conflict. And that's super important amongst organizational leaders 
and, and civil society. Look, at the, at the end of the day, right, I would just say this, Oren, you, you know this. Anti-Semitism uh, has come back in the United States largely, right, built off of two issues. One is actually a success of the 1960s civil rights movement. Believe that. Right? So you have African Americans who advance right, successfully right, a challenge, a successful challenge to Jim Crow and segregation in America. Now imagine for a second, right, you are an arch segregationist. You've been raised and socialized all your life to see black people and other people of color as uh, uh, less than human. How do you come to terms right, with the fact that you just suffer? a huge loss, right, defense of inequality, by the way, right, to folks you see as inferior. Do you all of a sudden just switch, you know, your brain over and say, well, I guess black people aren't inferior after all. That's not what happened. Anti-Semitism then began, became the explainer for folks of how black folks were able to achieve civil rights. And anti-Semitism then began, became the explainer Right, for every other gain of civil rights in this society. And that's why you see, sadly, elected officials right, utilizing this, this rhetoric uh, 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 today. They know right, that it fuels this type of anxiety. But on uh, the social justice side, right, the, the hard conversation is around Israel and Palestine. Right? And under the stress of that conversation, right, anti-Semitism bubbles up. And as human rights activists, right, the, the onus is on us to do a better job understanding anti-Semitism. If we want to have hard conversations, we have to prepare so that bigotry doesn't find its way in there. And we do that right, by doing our own work and then for those of us who are trainers, who are concerned about opening up the space to counter anti-Semitism, we can't treat every anti-Semitic statement as if it's coming out of the mouth of David Duke or, or Louis Farrakhan, right? Uh, we haven't had serious conversations outside of the Anti-Defamation League. Look, I want to be clear. We haven't had serious conversations around anti-Semitism in the United States for nearly 20 years. And we're expecting that everyone is suddenly an expert. And that's not simply the case. And that's why trainings like this, right, uh, academic studies become so important, and, and community training and education as well. You know, there's, there's two other elements of this sort of rise in anti-Semitism. One is, you know, the denial of anti-Semitism. So when you, you know, point out, um, you know, the, the data that we're seeing record high numbers of anti-Semitic incidents reported to ADL, the FBI hate crime data uh, shows, you know, similar rises that the Jewish community, even though being among the smallest, um, is always at the top of the list in terms of those that are targeted. Hi, I remember you. Um, and then, uh, you know, so in addition to, to denial, there's also um, the inability, to your point, to even recognize anti-Semitism. You were saying, how do we how do we train people when, you know, 20 years it hasn't necessarily been a conversation? To me, that's the scariest part, is that people don't even know how to recognize it, whether it's on their social media feeds, whether it is from the mouths of our, you know, politicians or public speakers, et cetera. Um, the inability to understand these tropes. And so I do think that it's super important to then not like sit through, you know, 10 classes of history, but there has to be a way for people to get better and up to speed at the history of anti-Semitism and what it looks like, because that way you'll understand how it, like the modern manifestations of it. You know, during the pandemic, you know, there were all these conspiracies that the Jews were responsible for this pandemic because they were gonna make money off of a vaccine or because Jews themselves are, you know, trying to capitalize uh, off of, um, you know, chaos and, and societal, like uh, uh, society going, running amok. And yet at the same time, we also saw, you know, as we were all on Zoom, for example, or our various platforms, that anti-Semites found a way to leverage new technologies in order to bring anti-Semitism into our own homes. So there's always this balance between, you know, old tropes, but really modern tactics of disseminating that. And I think if we understand what anti-Semitism and those basic tropes are, we understand how hatred writ large is disseminated, we are going to find those spots where we can actually mitigate 
anti-Semitism in a different way. And so right. to you, I mean, have you seen the way anti-Semitism, those old sort of age-old tropes are finding modern manifestations? Yeah, uh, uh, we see these happening all the time now, right? So we, we saw in the midst of COVID, right? So the stressor of COVID, we saw uh, uh, flyers being, being spread uh, uh, around the country, uh, particularly in black and Latino communities, right? That were telling folks, don't go to the Jewish hospital, right? Uh, uh, Jewish doctors will infect you, right, with uh, 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 COVID, right? Uh, now, who was spreading those flyers? Who knows, right? But they were being spread because folks felt it would resonate, right, in, inside of the community. So, so we see it there. I, it was just, uh, I'm getting my weeks confused, um, but I think it was um, uh, over the last couple of days, right, that I saw something online, right, where an individual was making fun of an elected official whose last name was Goldman, right, and uh, uh, using that, right, that, that's, a, that's an anti-Semitic trope. They were turning his last name, right, into, into this trope. And uh, we, we see it all the time, Oren, right? Uh, record levels of examples of, of anti-Semitism. We could list them out literally for the next hour. So do you feel that the more people are familiar with the way these uh, tropes have played out in the past yeah. would impact the way that they try to be mindful of using those tropes in the present, right? So this is kind of the question also with public officials that we're seeing. I agree with you that there are times where people say things, maybe they didn't understand how that would land on a community, That's right? right? Um, but it is the way to sort of make people more mindful of what they're saying, not just against you know the Jewish community, but other communities, is to sort of give a history. And then the question is, who has time for that? Like, yeah. what is the best way to actually, you know, yeah. teach people how to do that? We all have jobs, everybody has families. Like, when do you sort of carve out time to be, uh, to have the skin in the game, yeah. if you will? And so this is yeah. back to you. Like, how should people carve out time to be anti-racist? Yeah. So there's, there's, there's three things. And we should, we didn't even get into anti-Semitism as a form of racism, right? The, you know, there are different constructions of anti-Semitism. And one of the forms of anti-Semitism, right, places Jews as, as a racialized other. And that's kind of the area that I spend my time trying to, to, to tackle. Here's, here's things that I think we should do or should be thinking about doing. So one is we should be practicing having hard conversations, right? That they're actually with compassion with our friends, right? Look, my, uh, uh, I have a diverse set of friends uh, uh, in this world. And uh, some of my friends say racist things, right? They don't mean to. Right? They're not trying to make my day uh, worse. They live in a society that is filled with anti-black stereotypes, and sometimes they stumble into that. And, you know, these are my friends, and I have to practice, right? I practice on my friends, right? How to have these conversations, right? I'm not trying to flame out my friend. I'm not trying to make my friend break down in tears, right? I'm trying to build a relationship. And that's the first thing that we have to understand. Who is it that we're trying to build a relationship with, right? And who is it that we're just simply trying to hold accountable? Right? And that should first guide your tactics in engaging in discussions right, around anti-Semitism. But you have to practice first. The second is this piece, who's got time? Right? Uh, uh, everyone is busy. Most folks in this country are working two or three jobs right, to, to make ends meet. I think we have to go back to traditional storytelling, right? the ways that we communicated stories to one another, right? Through, through film, through television, through music, right? Through poetry, right? Really tapping into culture, right? To, to, to relay our stories. So that's the second. The third is, is you have to support organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, right? Bend the Ark, right? There are these organizations that are taking on anti-Semitism in the Jewish community, right? And they need to be supported in that important work right now. Last thing, last thing, and this is a big ask, right? Uh, it's time, and particularly uh, for an elder population in the Jewish community, but not all, 
But it's time for the Jewish community to start talking about the individual acts of anti-Semitism that they have experienced as a child, right? Growing up in the South, growing up in the red-lined uh, 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 Northeast, right? Being the only Jew, right, in uh, your school in Portland, Oregon, right? It, until the Jewish community starts to tell the stories of anti-Semitism, not just the physical assaults that take place, right? Not just the massive terror attacks, but the day-to-day -day grind of anti-Semitic bigotry. There will be no movement on this issue. And that's the hardest piece, to tell a story, right, of a moment when you were probably vulnerable. But until we start telling those stories, I think folks will have a hard time understanding just how widespread anti-Semitism is. Um, I remember a couple years ago, uh, this was before the pandemic, so maybe 104 years ago, um, <clears throat> you and I were on a, a panel and you, you made this analogy that frankly I've, I've stolen uh, quite a bit. Cool. Um, it was a, 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 about Fashion Week. Oh, yeah. Now just, just bear with me. This is going to make sense, I promise. Settle it. <laughs> so and I, I don't want to say, I mean, you should do this, but, no, ba no, no, but basically is, is this idea of, you know, we're, we're talking about some of the most extreme things, yeah. violence against Jews, hatred, shootings, etc. But, but under, underneath that, right, is the normalization of the hatred that makes that happen. And so Fashion Week, if I understood it, and you correct me since you know, I mean, look at he's, the way he's dressed versus me. I think I should take this tie <laughs> off. Is, is sort of, you all know what happens at Fashion Week. It's like the most absurd sort of fashions. And nobody actually wears what we see in Fashion Week. It just sort of informs the type of clothing, right, that then becomes normalized that you find off the rack. That's what anti-Semitism and extremism is, That's right. right? At the most extreme levels, what we have to look at is not just preventing that next attack, but it's how do we prevent the normalization so that it's not just off the rack, kind of a statement made by a public official, you know, a tweet that is made on our social media platform. So I don't know if I captured it exactly, but do you see how we can use that sort of Fashion Week um, example yeah. to make it fashionable to combat anti-Semitism and bigotry? Can we twist it? Yeah. I mean, we, we have to model, right? So I sound very excited. I'm probably up here smiling, right? Model, um, no pun intended. Uh, model, that's right. Um, look, uh, we have to practice. We, we're in a time, I just want to come back to, to the beginning of uh, this conversation. We are under major stressors right now, right? And I don't mean just in the United States, right? COVID, right? Uh, uh, huge swaths of economic inequality, uh, uh, political violence, right? That is, is uh, uh, across, uh, raging across the country. Uh, the, the list goes on, right? Climate disasters uh, uh, that are happening. And it's in those stresses that, that we have to understand, right? That, societies evolve and, and move forward or, or, they, or they stagnate, right? The world moves forward or it, or it stagnates. And moving forward doesn't mean frenetic and, and chaotic, right? Um, uh, moving forward means determined about moving everyone forward together, right? So that we have opportunity, we have safety, we have equity, we have hopes and, and dreams in our society. And we're disconnected. All of us are disconnected from that uh, 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 right now. So the way that we get back, right, the, the way that we create that model, that extreme model that uh, no one's going to wear, but it's going to give folks a chance to practice, is really forcing ourselves, it's going to sound so simple that no one's going to do it because they're going to think it's not effective, <laughs> right? It's forcing yourself to stay at the table, right, with folks who fundamentally hold some of the same larger values as you do, right? And you're in total disagreement about the, the specifics. I, I think of, um, there's a law enforcement officer. You can imagine, I probably don't hang out with a lot of law enforcement. No one's gonna be shocked by that. But I have a, a really uh, now uh, close acquaintance, right? And uh, it was a very similar thing, right? Uh, 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 he and I were like uh, uh, out of space, and uh, uh, and he said he was he was observing the crowd, and he said, you know, everyone here hates enforcement, 
And uh, uh, I said, you know, I don't hate law enforcement, right? That, that's not what I go around doing my day. And, uh, and then he said, do you know any law enforcement officers? And so I said, I, I didn't. Right? And uh, that's the first time we saw each other. We, just, we just ran into each other uh, uh, a little bit. But, but now we meet about every two months, and we actually just have, uh, 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 we actually don't talk about nice things. We actually talk, have really hard conversations, but we're just listening to each other, right? And uh, sitting at that table together, right, and we do it in public because people see us, right, that people see me sitting with this law enforcement officer, right? Um, uh, we have hard conversations. We don't try to solve those conversations. We're practicing actually sitting at a table together, right? And the practice of having a hard conversation, right, full of emotion, right, with one another is going to be super productive one day, right? It's going to help my community. And I think in the same way, all of us, right, we are in a moment, right, where the country is being defined and redefined, right, in a way that says that most of us don't belong. And the way that we push back against that is by taking on the underlying main theme of why we don't belong, why we don't belong, anti-Semitism, right? If you've never read the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, don't go buy a copy, but you should read, right? It's the main anti-Semitic conspiracy that's being used to divide us. The way we respond is by coming back to the table even if we can't talk with one another, even if we're only talking about our children, because that's the only thing we can talk about, we have to be back at the table. If we're not brave enough to get back at the tables with one another, how in the hell are we going to come up with the courage to transform a society where everyone feels they belong? Yeah, thank you. I just want to be clear, law enforcement loves me, um, so no, I'm just, just, just kidding. Uh, not really, you know. Um, so uh, I think with, with a couple minutes left before we, we, uh, we move on to the next speakers, and you're going to hear more about, you know, what is, you know, Jewish personhood? What does it mean? Who, who are the Jews? You're going to hear a lot more about some of this contextualizing um, uh, information, which is important to the discussion from, from other speakers. You know, one of the main things you and I are really here for um, is, is to talk about how all of this is really undermining our democratic institutions. Yes. And that, you know, if you want to find any one reason to combat anti-Semitism, is that, you know, without combating this form of hatred, your world, your community, your laws, your ability to be who you are is going to change no matter who it is that you are. And you know, there's a through line between the Jews will not replace us to shootings that we've talked about to even the insurrection. You know, disinformation is the lifeblood of extremist movements. And disinformation and conspiracies are now the sort of core of what is winning people's hearts and minds. And so, you know, maybe the, the last word can be on this, like. Is it hyperbole to say that the fight against anti-Semitism is the fight for the soul of our democracy? Is that, is that defensible statement? Yeah, look, in uh, uh, 1968, segregationists understood uh, uh, that the idea of a separate and unequal America uh, was no longer going to be. And, uh, Racism would not allow them to accept right, that uh, black people had built a moral movement for change in this country that transformed the country in good ways for everyone. Right? And uh, they built a multiracial coalition. And uh, there was, uh, uh, within that, I don't want to, you know, people romanticize black Jewish coalition building and, and relationships. I don't want to over-romanticize it. But I also don't want to underplay it, right? You had two people, right? Two groupings of peoples, Jews, right? And African Americans who had experienced some parallel experiences within their histories. Right? that intertwined for some of them 
the idea of a better world for, for both. And it propelled the civil rights movement in, in significant ways. There were tensions, like, you know, don't, don't believe the hype, right? Uh, we have a much more romanticized version of what those relationships were like now, right, than in uh, uh, 1968. They were hard. Those were hard relationships, and they didn't get a lot of support from the broader communities, right, uh, from their communities. They were risk takers. So part of it, I think, is, is understanding uh, uh, there's a risk here. But I'm a person for uh, over 35 years has organized in rural and urban places in America, right, national organizations, local communities, government, right? And I know one thing from having uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, watching people uh, be harassed and terrorized by these white nationalist movements, right? Uh, and I mean victims like law enforcement, healthcare workers, educators, right? Elected officials, Native American, black folks, gays and lesbians, right? Everyone who doesn't belong. And ultimately, right? Uh, we all know the secret to this one. Ultimately, none of us belong, right? In, in that society. So if you think you belong, right? You're just buying into the hype, ultimately. None of us have a place uh, uh, in that society. The bedrock narrative is anti-Semitism, right? And there is such a resistance to understanding anti-Semitism in America, right? Particularly even by human rights and social justice organizations. They don't even understand the main narrative that is driving this division. So that's why anti-Semitism becomes critical for, for us to push forward. But there's another piece here, right? And I think, Oren, you, you hit on this so well, right? It is time for us to do away with conspiracy theories, right? And it is time to embrace, I'm an old punk rocker, so I'm a DIYer, right? Do it, do it yourself, right? Uh, uh, sometimes even the libertarians like me when I start talking about DIY. But we get rid of conspiracies because conspiracies disempower us. They tell us there's nothing we can do to affect change in our society. And that's the power of anti-Semitism, right? It lets us off the hook by saying there's nothing we can do about these things happening in our society. And the bonus is we're gonna give you someone to blame. Uh, uh, for that. And it always starts with the Jews, right? That's where the canary in the coal mine uh, reference comes from. Always, anti-Semitism always starts by blaming the Jews, right? But ultimately resolves, right, with attacks and violence, not just on the Jewish community, right, but every other vulnerable or marginalized community or anyone else who's seen on the, uh, as being in the way. They become part of that conspiracy. So that's why we tackle anti-Semitism. And look, it's good practice to get us back into the room. If we can get back in the room, if we can all get back in the room on this issue, I think we can get back in the room almost on any issue in America. So, I mean, just to, to conclude here, I think, you know, one of, if I'm taking the themes out of what we've discussed, right, is that anti-Semitism is both unique, um, but it's also universal, right? We have to understand the unique places that anti-Semitism comes from, but we also have to understand how it is manipulated and exploited to target a whole bunch of people in our institutions. And then, I mean, I think, you know, Eric is always so um, clear about this, right? The importance of education and engagement as one of the things that we can do to push back, right? And this is why I think this conference today and what you'll be hearing throughout the day from all these other speakers and the panels is gonna be so important because hopefully it'll provide, you know, some initial steps uh, for those that have been doing this for a long time or those who this is kind of your first time entering the space, um, ways to move forward. And ultimately, at the end of the day, this is where the hope comes in. You know, this moment in time is not going to be remembered for the Colleyvilles and the insurrections and the shootings, but it will be remembered for what good people did to push back against that hate. And I think showing up today is a really incredible start to that. So thank you all for being here. Thank you.